Hello, I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient to modern times and everything in between. You can find more podcast episodes, written interviews, war games, and the most detailed military history timeline on the web at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. We're on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. You can send comments and suggestions to info at warscholar.org. Thanks for listening. I'm speaking with Chris Makowski, author of Entertaining History, the Civil War in Literature, Film, and Song, published uh, January 13, 2020 by Southern Illinois University Press. Thank you for speaking with me. I'm delighted to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so tell me, how did you uh, get into studying this subject and writing this book? Or uh, editing it, actually. Sure. Well, I think most of us who are Civil War fans uh, have like a favorite book or a favorite movie that, um, if if it didn't get them hooked on Civil War studies in the first place, um, still somehow played a very instrumental role in in kind of developing their love for the field. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I really wanted to spend some time kind of exploring those things that made people fall in love with the Civil War. Um, I'm uh, an English, uh, my, my PhD is actually in English and creative writing, so that's kind of where my background comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my studies at Binghamton University, I spent some of my focus on Civil War-related literature, and that was kind of the, the genesis of this project. Uh, but I really wanted to bring in a lot of other people to participate so that it would feel more like a a book club, I guess, or a conversation mm -hmm. rather than just me trying to sound like some sort of formal official guy spouting out about uh, Civil War literature. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, nothing ruins a good book worse than an academic trying to talk about it in a scholarly way. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so as far as your personal interest in the Civil War, how did that uh, how did that come about? And um what do you like to what does the book focus on it seems to have uh it seems to touch on all kinds of media so tell me also how you um break that down sure and it actually started out with a, an even broader focus my thought at first was to just talk about kind of the ways that the civil war interacts with popular culture I ended up with so much good stuff, we split this into two volumes, so this is going to be the first of two volumes mm -hmm. uh, and what I really tried to do is take. Uh, all the things that were texts, uh, if I can use that phrase broadly, and, and so like a book, a TV show, a movie, a song, uh, photographs, um, that's what this book focuses on. And then some of the other sort of cultural connections will be in the second book. Mm -hmm. So this book really looked at those those things in popular media. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to have the first section focus on um, both fiction and nonfiction. So it, it covers everything from um, Stephen Crane and the Red Badge of Courage up through uh, Shelby Foote and his narrative. Um, Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs are in there, Confederates in the Attic, mm -hmm. um, Jeff Shara and, and Michael Shara's fiction. Uh, so a, a pretty broad range of, of stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, the second section really looks at uh, we call it the Civil War in film, and so we start literally with uh, photography at Antietam, and then we take a look at uh, kind of the next big visual jump, which was the cyclorama craze uh, with a focus on the Gettysburg cyclorama, and that was kind of like the uh, the IMAX of its day. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we really get into uh, some films and uh, some TV shows. And then the last section uh, focuses on songs and, and different uh, Civil War-related songs. Uh, Dixie, uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic, up through um, Ashokan Farewell, and the Civil War on Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see that uh, you also you look at television shows. What, what shows? I don't think you named any of the shows. that, uh, Or is that in the next book? Sure, no, no. Uh, in this book, in the 70s and early 80s, kind of the big uh, trifecta were Roots, um, the blue and the gray, mm -hmm. and north and south. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people remember watching those miniseries on TV back in the day. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's been said that uh, interest in the Civil War, while there are certainly many people very much interested in, in it, has kind of waned um, lately. So I'm curious um, how much your book addresses that. The actual um, opening essay 
uh, deals with something that I call the Ken Burns effect, mm-hmm. where a large media event happens that relates to the Civil War, and it actually has a positive impact on visitation at battlefields and historic sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken Burns being the, no- the most uh, notable example of that, when his uh, film came out on PBS, uh, America stopped what it was doing and watched public television. It was the highest rated public TV show of all time uh, up to that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, the following year when spring came around and people started to hit the road on vacations, visitation at battlefields skyrocketed. Um, and we've seen that happen with other um, mass mostly movies, but sometimes books. So you can really trace a, a definite connection between David McCullough's books and visitation at sites that are related to his stuff. And there's a spillover effect. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about his book, John Adams, and visitation at the John Adams site went up and up and up and has continued to, to go up because of that book. Mm-hmm. But also, you know, people started visiting the Johnstown Flood National Historic Site because he wrote a book about Johnstown Flood. And they read the John Adams biography and thought, oh, gosh, what else can I read by this guy? He's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So they start picking up other books and then start visiting other sites related to those other books. Um, So uh, certainly overall, um, visitation has continued to go down. Mm -hmm. But one of these books or movies uh, comes out, it really does inspire people to go and and pick things up and out. Mm-hmm. How about, uh, I see reenactor on the cover of the book. Um, do you also talk about reenactment and, and that sort of thing? That'll actually be in the second book. We've got a couple essays related to that in the second book. Um, one about reenacting in general. And again, interest in that hobby has, has started to dwindle, particularly since the 150th anniversary uh, passed a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And there's also another um, essay in that book that talks about how the movie Glory really sparked a huge resurgence in interest in the United States colored troops mm-hmm. and uh, how reenactors related to the USCT have really gotten the chance to take the stage and educate people about a long forgotten component of the war. Mm-hmm. One thing I was going to add was that mm-hmm. the uh, the person on the cover that you mentioned is a historian named Doug Ullman. He's a former historian with the American Battlefield Trust, mm-hmm. and he's sort of doing his impersonation of Robert Lee Hodge from Confederates in the Attic. And uh, folks who are familiar with that book uh, remember sort of this grumpy looking Confederate who's posed there with a big knife, and, and uh, that's actually uh, Robert Lee Hodge, who's a kind of a main character in that book. And then Doug, on the cover of our book, is sort of doing his homage to that and he's holding confederates in the attic in one hand and instead of a big bowie knife he's uh holding an ipod that's plugged into his ear to kind of demonstrate <laughs> the uh, the connection to pop culture <laughs> interesting so um how about the controversy you know with monuments and memorials you know with the whole confederacy thing um you know that you've seen we've seen lately do you think that's actually helped to spark more interest in civil war um, studies, or do you think it, it had a negative effect, or do you, did you see anything? Um, I work with a blog called EmergingCivilWar.com, and anytime a monument controversy erupts in the news, we see our readership skyrocket um, because people are hungry to know more and, and learn more. Um, I think, unfortunately, what the monument controversies have done and, and flag controversies um, is really kind of illustrated how narrow-minded people are about things, uh, you know, they they just don't have a whole lot of cultural or historical context for these discussions. And so it tends to be a lot of um, knee-jerk reactions and uh, what we in the field call presentism, where you judge past events by today's standards, not by the standards of the day. Um, That's not in any way to defend anything to do with any flag or any monument, but rather just to kind of comment on the fact that uh, these discussions really should be more nuanced and more contextualized and are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, history falls by the wayside, um, the study of history, I think. It does. And I think our conversations about such things as monuments tell us more about ourselves today than they do about the people who put the monuments up um, back when they were raised. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so as far as um, the different media that you look at, do you see any, um, what sort of threads do you see? Is there, uh, like you mentioned, Stephen Crane, is there a lot of, um, does a lot of it dwell on the sadness of the Civil War or, you know, maybe the pomp and circumstance of the uniforms and, and you know, the 
the songs and all that. How, how do you, you know, how did, uh, what do you see? In what sure. You there's know? a kind of one main thread that goes through a lot of this and best exemplified by, I, I guess, phrase we would call moonlight and magnolias. Um, sort of the gone with the wind idea of the civil war. And, uh, yeah, that very much ties into the uh, long discredited, lost cause theory of the war, although uh, many, many people still buy into that lost cause myth that, uh, you know, the antebellum South was this great place of, of pastoral beauty and the slaves were all happy and slavery had nothing to do with the war. And uh, the Yankees were awful, terrible people and the South didn't lose. They were just overpowered and uh, the South will rise again. And, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that sort of romanticized vision of the war um, exemplified by Gone with the Wind is something that comes up over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And one reason that historians have had such a tough time combating it is because popular media like Gone with the Wind have played such an influential part in perpetuating those uh, myths and stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, another great example, one we don't really talk about in the book that uh, we've written about on the blog, though, is um, Birth of the Nation, D.W. Griffith's uh, Birth of the Nation, um, at which really uh, set a lot of those stereotypes into stone and influenced the way people uh, started to think about the Civil War and its meaning and what it did or didn't mean. And, um, and that just really has been a, a set of stereotypes that has been perpetuated ever since uh, historians have long disproven a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff and yet people still cling to it because uh, popular media continues to shape those attitudes mm -hmm. i'm speaking with chris makowski editor of entertaining history the civil war in literature film and song you can find more information at emergingcivilwar.com if you like this podcast, please rate it and don't forget to follow and like me at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at warscholar. Now back to the podcast. I've also noticed that uh, the feeling I get is that Civil War studies are more popular uh, in the South or people who feel connected to the South, and often a lot of movies... Um, old west or civil war movies it, it feels like you often see the yankees as the bad guys you know and i'm thinking of shane and uh i forget like more recently i wonder if um open range was was the hero a conf or a former confederate or um you know you, you see what i'm saying it seems as though yeah, yeah. there is a, a certain the audience is mostly of a certain mind do, do, do you find that in the stuff you uh you guys wrote about in this book um, I don't know that we saw a particular theme like that. One thing we do talk about is that connection between kind of the, the Civil War and then the West, because after the war, uh, the North in particular looked toward westward expansion. Um, that's one major reason why Reconstruction failed is the national attention span it just wasn't long enough to sustain uh, the, the hard work that Reconstruction required. So you had a lot of these old veterans who would go out west and were involved with uh, uh, you know stories out there and so you have these grizzled old timers or you have people who did something in the war who now have to uh, either find redemption or they have to uh, you know they, they finally find their comeuppance when they get out there so the war kind of continues out in the old west mm -hmm. what are some of the um, so you already mentioned some of the movies or some of the TV shows um, and books and such what what other um, media do you do you discuss in the book that maybe people aren't fully familiar with that you, you'd like to well, highlight and I think that uh, you know we, we hit a lot of the major ones but the book's not intended to be all-encompassing but uh, uh, you know, uh, one of my colleagues, Meg Rowling, wrote about Bruce Catton's Army of the Potomac series. In Bruce Catton in the 1960s, when the Civil War centennial was going on, he was just a hugely influential voice in getting people interested in the Civil War. I mean, there's a whole generation of people who will say that Bruce Catton is the writer who got them hooked on the war. I um, mean, you know, Meg talks about the Army of the Potomac series, but, but Catton wrote a bunch of other Civil War stuff, too, and sort of used... Um, the Army of the Potomac series is kind of the model which with you could, you could sort of discuss uh, other Bruce Catton works. Um, 
Uh, one of the things that uh, Chris Barr is a, his, a former historian at, at Andersonville. He's now at the uh, reconstruction site that's uh, that's brand new. Um, he wrote about not only McKinley Cantor's Pulitzer winning novel Andersonville, but then there was also a uh, a play about Andersonville that a lot of people sort of forget about. But when it first came out, it was uh, hugely popular, hugely influential, and uh, it was restaged for the 150th anniversary. Something that's a little unexpected there. Um, it was uh, the Andersonville Trial was the name of the play, and uh, so kind of pairing up something people might know the mm-hmm. novel with something they might not know the play um, was kind of a fun thing for us to to work into the book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Nick Sacco is a historian at Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site out in St. Louis, and he wrote about Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs, um, but he did so in a way like as someone who uses the memoirs all the time to help interpret that site, mm-hmm. um, you know, he had some pretty interesting insights into the memoirs as a work of nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And so his essay in there is really great because it, it, it doesn't sort of take a necessarily a traditionally scholarly view, but rather a hands-on, uh, this is a working living document. Um, it's got all of his biases and perceptions in here. And here's how it helps me understand this house that he used to own and live in and, and you know, what life was like here on this plantation. Um, so it really is a kind of a neat way to, to look at the memoirs as a living document. Um, so there are those lots of those sorts of, of I think, surprises uh, and uh, neat twists and turns um, throughout the book as we look at these uh, these different books and movies and such. Is there an essay in there that addresses um, sort of national park? You mentioned the cyclorama, cyclorama, but any other discussions of the national parks as a, um, not as a park, but so much as a presentation of history? You know, with- Sure, that's actually something we're saving for volume two, um, because the parks certainly do... Um, as entities that control a lot of the resources, that gives them a certain amount of control over the story about those resources. Uh, now, digital media has really democratized history in a way that uh, the, the Park Service doesn't control the history like it once used to. Um, you can go on to any number of battlefields, for instance, and download an app from the American Battlefield Trust, or you can call up a Wikipedia page. Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can now access the history. Um, the Park Service doesn't quite have the uh, uh, the monopoly on it as it used to. Mm-hmm. That said, the Park Service remains, I think, the most important and most significant gateway for people to interact with Civil War history because you can go to these parks and and see the museums that they have and look at the artifacts and talk to historians and have great conversations and interact with the resources. Um, So the parks are are absolutely vital. Um, The Park Service did a lot for the 150th, the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, and they were really hoping that it would kind of catch on the way that, for instance, the Ken Burns movie had people catch on to the Civil War. Uh, the Park Service was really hoping the Sesquicentennial would drive people fields. Um, it didn't have quite that sort of success, uh, but it still managed to do a lot to educate folks about uh, about the Civil War. As far as the, uh, I, I, obviously you're familiar with the work the American Battlefield Trust does, um, how much, do you think there's a lot of awareness of, of the campaigns to buy up land near parks to expand uh, the battlefield parks and that sort of thing, and um, and and what effect do you think their work has in in public knowledge of the Civil War? That's a great question because I think every preservation organization would tell you that not enough people know about their work, mm-hmm. um, and and you'd be surprised at how few people care about their work. Uh, I live in the Fredericksburg area. I'm involved both with the American Battlefield Trust and with the uh, local preservation group called the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're situated in Fredericksburg. We've got the the Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Mine Run battlefields all around us. And there are so many people here uh, that 
could care less, quite frankly. Right. And uh, so it's always an effort by any preservation organization to not only raise awareness, but then help people realize, like, this is history that took place in your backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff happened right in, literally in your backyard or right in your street or, you know, and, and these are great resources that you can take advantage of to learn more about history that uh, has a huge impact on you. It makes me wonder if the, this key to success is for someone to create a really cool Civil War uh, game, video game, that, that kids like really get into, and then that sparks the interest, you know? Um, I'm not sure if you're... I'll just mention there's a, a game series called Assassin's Creed, and they did... They, they set these games in different historical periods, and they did one in the American Revolution, which I think prompted a bunch of young people to be interested in the American Revolution. So my son played that game. He was a huge fan. I uh, loved it a lot. Video games are something that uh, actually we cover in the next book as well, hmm. um, because video gaming, um, board gaming, those are all, and, and miniature gaming. Those are all three different uh, sort of genres that um, really have their own very passionate followings uh, hmm. and help people. Uh, stay engaged. And a lot, I know um, a lot of people who do miniature gaming who then like to go out onto the battlefield and kind of walk around and helps them better understand what they're doing uh, mm-hmm. in their games. Mm-hmm. Are there any other issues uh, covered in the book that we haven't uh, touched on yet? I think that uh, a couple of things that um, are particular favorites of mine um, one is that I contributed to the book was actually about the writer Shelby Foote. <laughs> And uh, a lot of people know Shelby Foote from his appearance in the Ken Burns documentary. And he's sort of this crusty old figure with this southern accent. And he looks a little grandfatherly and looks a little benign. And so he's and he's a great storyteller. Um, and a lot of people have taken issue with Foote's um, stories about the war and with his, his massive three-volume, The Civil War, A Narrative, because uh, Foote does – get really caught up in these stories that, um, for better lack of a better phrase, um, aren't well documented or they sound too good to be true. Mm-hmm. And so Foote gets accused of uh, telling stories um, just because they're good stories, not necessarily because they're factual. And uh, one of the things that Foote would always say is like, he's a writer first, not a historian, and that there's a, a significant difference between the related ideas of fact and truth. Uh, And as a writing professor myself, I deal with that kind of stuff all the time with my own students. Mm -hmm. And Foote really talks about, like, you can have all the facts you want, and they try to get at a larger truth, but facts aren't the truth. Um, and, And writing can help you get at truth in a way that a bunch of facts can't. Mm-hmm. And I think that the people who nitpick foot, you know, do so because they're they're married to facts and they sort of forget that larger truth that he's trying to illuminate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something different. He never claimed to be a historian. He always claimed to be a writer. So another interview that we have in the book is, or another essay that we have in the book is an interview that H.R. Gordon did with the novelist Jeff Shara. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff's a best-selling Civil War writer. He's written a lot of great historical novels. Super nice guy, very gracious with his time. Um, He's operating in the big leagues and doesn't need to necessarily spend some time talking to to folks, and he does. He's very, very gracious. Mm -hmm. And he talks a lot about that relationship between um, fact and truth and, and the way that fiction can shed light on something in a way that facts can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, he's sometimes taken some flack for his work because like, oh, yeah, he's writing a novel, he's making stuff up. And, and Jeff is very conscientious to stick to facts and information and things that can be verified. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's very conscientious that way. But he does have a novelist's license to get inside characters' heads in a way that a historian can't. Mm -hmm. And I think the results um, really can be very illuminating Mm -hmm. uh, about a piece of history. Yeah, because I think uh, someone's um, feelings about what they read also reflect on their own beliefs and and motivations and goals. Um, Oh, absolutely. I mean, people read a book or watch a movie through the lens of their own experience. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll choose to pick up that book or watch that TV show based on their own biases and interests. And then how they interpret that 
uh, you know, is also affected by those things. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to add, you mentioned Bruce Catton, and uh, that's actually one of the first writers or historians I read for the Civil War, and I think I read much of his series, many of his books, so I, I really enjoyed those. And he's a beautiful writer. I mean, some of his passages are just um, poetry in prose form. It's just beautiful, beautiful writing. Oh, yeah. Um, so now let's turn to um, the resources that uh, that the essayists use for um, for this work. I mean, I can imagine a huge bibliography for this, for all these essays, considering how much has been produced, you know, over, you know, 150 some years on the Civil War. Um, how did you guys approach it or how did you approach it as a group? Uh, that's a great question um, because I really wanted these essays to be accessible to readers. Um, as I said earlier, I wanted to kind of feel like a book club where we're just going to kind of sit around and talk about our favorite books. So I encouraged authors, uh, essayists to really be personal in their approach about these books. Um, the things that made them fall in love with these movies and songs and stuff are the things that made other people fall in love with them. So I think that that's a way to get these topics to resonate with readers. Um, that said, you know, these aren't just like, oh, let me tell you why I think the song Dixie's the greatest song in the whole wide world and why I love it so much. Um, so there is a great deal of, of research so that there's some historical context. Um, you know, how did the song get written? How did it become famous? How did it take on the life of the unofficial um, uh, unofficial anthem of the South? Why is it that Abraham Lincoln loved it so much? How does it live on today? What does it mean? So there's there's lots of that sorts of, of meat and potatoes in these essays too. Mm -hmm. So I hope that readers will find a nice balance of, of personal reflection and personal interaction um, along with uh, lots of good um, good research and, and scholarship. Um, but probably the, the essay that jumps out to me most thinking about that, uh, Meg Rowland wrote a second one. It was about the uh, Time Life series. Uh, and a lot of people remember that big set of books and 30-some volumes, or I think it was. And they were all bound in this uh, faux leather mm -hmm. silver with with um, you know uh, blue uh, shiny embossed lettering and it just looked really good on a shelf and, and Meg said as a kid she saw those and just was was fascinated by those books um, just because they looked so impressive and that was a great doorway into the war for her yeah. um, and that's a very personal story um, but I think of the the thousands and thousands of sets of that that uh, books that they got sold and it's like there are a lot of people that had that same experience yeah i certainly have looked through so i don't think yeah you know, we didn't own that then when i was young but i certainly looked through some of those and yeah they're they they feel majestic to just kind of carefully look through and read majestic that's a great word for those <laughs> and then you know you get into it and you find out some of the people who worked on that book and under the editorship of uh, jack davis who was kind enough to talk to meg a little bit for her essay mm -hmm. um you know that's a top-notch civil war scholar working on that stuff mm -hmm. um the the book series probably hasn't aged as well as it might have mm -hmm. um but boy i just know a lot of people who still like to have it because it just looks nice and it evokes a lot of really positive memories and that's the kind of thing that, that I'm hoping this essay collection gets at. You know, these books and movies and, and, and uh, TV shows and songs, um, they really evoke a lot of positive memories in people. Mm -hmm. And definitely um, Civil War collecting, you know, military, military collecting is still uh, big amongst the core group of people, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a it's a whole subset of the Civil War community would be the collectors, um, and they have Civil War shows all over the place where they get together and they um, swap artifacts, and you know, you find pictures of lost relatives or, or lost officers or, or you know whomever, um, and it's just a great opportunity to get together and, and talk about the material culture of the of the war, where you have these tangible reminders of of not only this grand national story, but of like your great, great, great grandfather, you know? And I think that that's such a cool thing about the, uh, the material culture and the, and the artifacts is, um, 
is so much of that history is still so personal because you've got your ancestor's revolver or you've got the letters that he wrote home to his wife and you've got her letters to him. And it's just like, wow, that is just such a tangible connection to the past. Mm -hmm. How much uh, interest did, did you find outside of the U.S. for the U.S. Civil War? There's actually quite a bit. Um, there's a huge roundtable, the United Kingdom roundtable. Um, there are roundtables in other countries. Um, and we have a lot of folks who will come to America to tour Civil War battlefields. Um, I've spent uh, years and years as a volunteer uh, for the National Park Service here in Fredericksburg, and, and in particular spent a lot of time at the Stonewall Jackson death site. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would, uh, it, just, it was amazing how many visitors from other countries would come in to talk about Stonewall Jackson, and they really knew the history. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the average visitor from overseas knows the Civil War better than the average visitor from America. Hmm. Um, and, well, and at first that surprised me, but then you think, well, okay, they're spending all that money to come here to do <laughs> this. They must be passionate about it in the first place. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but people from overseas who like the Civil War um, are really, really well informed about it. Is it uh, mostly English speakers or do you find many non-English uh, speaking fans? Yeah, I think uh, mostly English speakers. Um, I, yeah, I think that I've had some visitors from Asia. Uh, as I'm trying to kind of think back here quickly. Um, in different parts of Europe that aren't necessarily English speakers, but um, you know, German, French, uh, Belgium. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that that would be uh, kind of the the bulk of it. I'm speaking with. Chris Makowski, editor of Entertaining History, The Civil War in Literature, Film, and Song. You can find more information at EmergingCivilWar.com. If you like this podcast, please rate it, and don't forget to follow and like me at WarScholar.org, on YouTube at WarScholar1945, and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WarScholar. Now back to the podcast. I mean, I think Civil War uniforms are fun for a lot of people, like that whole period dress. I think people just like dressing up in that that kind of look, you know. Yeah, I mean, and again, that's something that's very evocative for people. You know, you see somebody uh, dressed up in Civil War, uh, uh, you know, whether it's a uniform, whether it's civilian dress. But it also is almost like an invitation. Come talk to me about the way I'm dressed up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a particularly effective way to get young people um, engaged and interested. You know? you, the book doesn't at all touch on uh, Disney's um, attempt to open a Civil War park in Virginia, does it? Uh, again, that's something we're saving for volume two. Um, okay. the, the whole notion of preservation. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think about, you know, how controversial that was. And there were strong feelings on both sides. And, um, you know, I know some people who who are ardent preservationists who wanted Disney to open up a theme park just outside of the Manassas battlefield. Mm. Because if you thought about all the tens of thousands of people that would be coming through there, that's an opportunity to reach tens of thousands of people to get them to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You know, so there were, those are people who wouldn't otherwise be showing up that you could, you know potentially hook right. and then there are other people who think that it was just sort of uh cheapened the history or commodified it or threatened to uh, to subsume it or um you know scrub it clean you know all sorts of uh, different reasons against it so it was uh, that was a really interesting preservation fight yeah well, when would the next book come uh, the second volume come out um it's actually um Geared for a couple of years down the road, we've mm -hmm. got another um, essay book that we're working on that talks about uh, what ifs of the war. And so we're going to get that out first, and then we will turn to uh, finishing up our uh, second volume in this. We wanted to also just kind of give a little space between the two pop culture books so that the first one had the chance to get its legs underneath it before the second one came along and nudged it, uh, gave it a body check against the boards, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what part of the research or editing for you was the most enjoyable? Probably the fact that I got to work with so many people that I really like who are writing about things that they were excited about. 
Um, and so there was just a great level of energy in this book, pulling it together, uh, because people were talking about their favorite movie, their favorite book, their favorite song. Um, and so that was really exciting. And then, you know, just as I said, a lot of people I really admire and respect, uh, Chris Brenneman, who wrote about the psychorama, he's like the authority on the Gettysburg psychorama and the chance to work with him and, and, you know, have him teach me a little something about the thing that he's most excited about, has the most expertise in. That's really cool. It was a huge privilege for me. Um, uh, Tony Horwitz had the chance to uh, talk with HR Gordon. She did a really great interview with Tony for one of her pieces. Um, and, uh, we finished this up just as Tony passed away unexpectedly as he was kind of doing uh, promotion for his latest book. Um, and so really, you know, we got to be some of the last people to talk to him about the civil war. And that was a, a really cool privilege too. And, uh, you know, what a huge blow that was to, to lose Tony who did so much to raise consciousness of, you know, in, in the, in the sort of the same way that Ken Burns did, mm -hmm. uh, really got a lot of people to pay attention to the civil war. Well, yeah. Uh, one other person that, that I got to talk to that was a real treat was uh, the musician Bobby Horton. And uh, Bobby has done homespun songs of the USA and of the CSA. He's got a huge library of Civil War era music that he has recorded and put out a whole series of CDs. And uh, Bobby lives in Birmingham, Alabama, and could not be a nicer guy. He's always so generous with his time. And, and it's like talking to the... Uh, the ultimate Southern gentleman. And he's always, he's got this great accent. And he's always so kind. And it's so fun to listen to him talk about his art. And he, you know, talks about making music and, you know, he's working on 16 different projects at a time. And, you know, a lot of his, a lot of the music you hear in Ken Burns documentaries comes from Bobby. Um, and geez, you know, I, I got off the phone with him and I'm like, man, every time I talk to that guy, I just feel like, 10 times better because he's <laughs> just such a fantastic human being. Uh, and so, you know, having those sorts of experiences working on this book just really made it a, a real privilege. Yeah. I, I feel, um, you know, since it's a book, you can't hear the music that you guys discuss, but it'd be really cool if there were a soundtrack that went with the book, but that's asking too much. Well, actually one of the things that we do because um, emerging civil war is a digital based um, company mm -hmm. um, and a digital based brand, um, we've got a lot of opportunity online to do some things that traditional books can't. So one of the things that's unique about this book series is um, each chapter has a QR code and you can scan it with your phone and it takes you to some web exclusive content that is piggybacked on our on our site, uh, Emerging Civil War. Oh, wow. So even though open up the book and hear the song you can scan the code and it'll take you to a web page and you can listen to bobby horton's music there um so there's a whole bunch of stuff that ties into all of these essays that extends the conversation online and uh, uh you know as an editor for me that's also been really cool and really fun because you know there were some essays or, or some some books or or uh, stories that we couldn't work into the book mm. that we did blog posts about, and we've got them all up there that folks can kind of extend that conversation there. Oh, that's really cool. So um, what did, uh, of all the essays that uh, you edited, was there something that really surprised you? Well, or what was the most surprising thing you came across? Oh, geez, that's a great question. I'm, I'm looking at the um, table of contents right now, and um, probably the one thing that leaps out to me them, uh, well, there, there may be a couple things, and then maybe they're small things. Um, I didn't realize just how how deeply involved Clive Cussler was with the recovery of the Hunley. Mm. And uh, there's a great essay in the book by Brian Hicks, who is a reporter for the uh, newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina. And he's been covering the Hunley ever since the search got going and covered the the, uh, the the TV show or the TV movie that they made for it and the recovery efforts and the restoration efforts and the, the conservation efforts. So he's been deeply involved as a reporter covering all that stuff. And he knew Clive Cussler, who, who just recently passed away, actually. And so I didn't realize that Clive had been um, as responsible as he was for finding a, a really – fascinating lost part of confederate history another real surprise for me um ashley webb wrote uh, a great piece about abraham lincoln and different 
sort of uh, most recent film appearances. Um, Lincoln has appeared in the films for, you know, decades and decades and decades. I think of him with uh, Shirley Temple in The Little Rebel. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But she wrote about not only the Academy Award winning even Spielberg's uh, version that Daniel Lewis uh, was Lincoln. But then she tied in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, (laughs) which was a really neat juxtaposition, actually. And then there was a straight-to-DVD knockoff of that movie about uh, Abraham Lincoln versus uh, zombies. Abraham Lincoln versus zombies. And so, you know, we've got this very sincere effort to portray Lincoln versus this really cheesy, uh, you know, Lincoln versus the zombies kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And actually really did a neat job of kind of juxtaposing these three visions of Lincoln that came out within just just a couple of years of each other. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a neat surprise for me. (laughs) Um, Was there a particular, did one of the essays, um, was there a particular difficult question that any of them addressed that maybe there was not a good answer to, if that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kevin Pollack wrote uh, two essays. One was about photography. Kevin's a licensed battlefield guide at Antietam, and of course, modern photojournalism was born at at uh, Antietam. But his second essay was about the portrayal of slavery in film, mm-hmm. and he kind of traced it from Gone with the Wind up through Twelve Years a Slave, and. Uh, you know, so you've got that Magnolias and Moonlight vision of of slavery in Gone with the Wind, and then you have a very hard, uncompromising look at slavery in Twelve Years a Slave, and um, that's an issue that today America still has trouble having a conversation about. Um, and you know, it's really impossible to talk about the Civil War without talking about race. It's it's impossible to talk about the ramifications and, and long-term repercussions of the war without talking about race. Uh, and that's one reason why the lost cause uh, has been so, had such a stranglehold on, on the public imagination, I think, because it ignores race or tries to, to whitewash it over. And uh, we really have to have that conversation. And so anytime that slavery shows up, in a movie or a TV show or something, um, it becomes one of those things that sets people on edge because it's an unresolved part of the American story. Mm-hmm. That reminds me, even uh, Monticello, they have uh, their their guides are uh, talk more openly about um, what it meant for Jefferson to uh, be a slave owner. Um, so they're they're more open about addressing that subject and not, you know, just kind of glossing over and forgetting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for years, you used to have to go down to Mulberry Row and kind of walk around there, and then you could sort of learn about the slave life at Monticello, and everyone seemed to live an industrious life and contributed to the overall health of this great great mountaintop retreat. Um, and now they're, I think, much more frank and much more open uh, and much more willing to talk about uh, what they like at Monticello. But that's a hard conversation for people to have. They don't, they don't want to have it. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we need to have it, I think. Yeah, people get very uncomfortable, but... Hey, you know, yeah. was there anything you came across in any of the essays that had maybe a, an unexpected emotional impact on you, either something very funny or maybe something really sad? Hmm. That's a great question, too. Um, I, I'll go back to Bobby Horton's uh, piece that I'd worked on with him. Um, he wrote a or he uh, performed a song called the Kennesaw line and it's based on the uh, journal of Sam Watkins who wrote a a very well-known memoir called company H and uh, just listen to how Bobby felt connected to Sam Watkins. And then after I did that interview, I went to um, the battlefield at Kennesaw mountain and then walked the dead angle where Sam Watkins had been and read Sam Watkins stuff out loud. And it was a rainy drizzly day. And, um, just kind of looking out across the, the field where he would have looked and, uh, that had a huge emotional impact on me. Um, it was a, a really great experience and it would not have been possible had Bobby not kind of opened up Sam Watkins account for me a bit there. Um, so, you know, that's something that was uh, a really neat takeaway from the book for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and 
you know, having Tony Horowitz pass away just as we were getting the book out and, you know, we were getting the, getting ready to get the book out, um, you know, that was kind of, you know, uh, an unexpected blow and, and uh, unfortunate too. Yeah, definitely. So what do you hope the book will do for readers? I hope that people will pick this up because, you know, Maybe they're a big fan of the song Ashok and Farewell and, oh, here's something I can read about it and tell me more about it. And then in the course of doing so, they see the essay about the Battle Hymn of the Republic by John Stauffer. And, you know, he's he's like written the, sort of the official biography of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So it was neat to get him on board and contribute an essay here um, so that, you know, people come and they, they, they come for one thing. And I hope that they will find a bunch of other stuff that sparks their interests and uh, maybe makes them go read a book or watch a movie that they otherwise might not have. And, and maybe even give them the the excuse to give something a second look mm. you know so like oh yeah i've always heard about um the north and the south tv miniseries but yeah you know whatever but after reading the essay maybe they're like oh well okay maybe i'll give that a watch and, and see what it was like um so that might be cool too so this is kind of uh maybe a very broad question and maybe not answerable here but h- how do you get people who don't think about the civil war or maybe you know not people who aren't interested not antagonistically not interested but just don't think about it how, how do you get them to pick up a book like this and start reading and, and become engaged you know that's probably the million dollar question is yeah. you know how do we get people interested in history right um and I'll admit, when I was growing up, you know, history was a bunch of names and dates and places I had to memorize, and it could not have been more uninspiring or, or unexciting to me. I mean, it was just boring. Um, what got me hooked was going out on the battlefield one day when my daughter was four, and uh, we were at Manassas, and there's a giant statue of Stonewall Jackson there. And uh, I didn't have any particular interest in the Civil War. We were just there because it was a place where a four-year-old could run around for a morning and burn out some energy. Mm-hmm. And she saw that statue and fell in love. And so we started going to battlefields because she wanted to go explore battlefields. And that became my way into the Civil War. And then I found out later that really it's not names and dates and places. It's stories about people just like you and me, Chris, mm-hmm. who had to go off leave their homes and go on, you know, what was the great adventure of their lifetime and the mo- most scary experience of their lifetime. And they had to leave their loved ones at home and, you know, literally throw themselves into these horrific situations. Um, you know, their wives, their moms, their, their, their kids were at home worried sick about them. And, uh, and then they had to go home and like pretend that life was normal again. And try to process all that. And you think about the human experience that is involved in all of that. You think about the millions and millions of people who suddenly were free at the end of that war after after centuries of bondage. People were just suddenly free. And then there was no plan to do anything about it. And so you start thinking about all these human elements. And it stops being about boring names and dates and places and becomes about people. Mm-hmm. And you can connect with people. You can try to understand people. You can empathize with people. Um, and I think that that's one reason that the books and the movies and the TV shows and the songs and such in, in this collection have been so successful is because they tell a, they tell good stories about people. Mm-hmm. And it stops being about boring history and, and about things that, that we can all relate to. And so, uh, so I think that's the key is, is remember that this is all a, a great story about people just like us. I think your example of your, of your being at the park with your daughter is one that illustrates the importance of, um, sort of the, the tactile and visual importance of like museums and parks and, uh, and even elaborate libraries, like people are drawn into beautiful spaces or, you know, just nature, and then you adorn it with, you know, history. So, mm-hmm. so that's just my argument for preservation of parks and such. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, parks are the most invaluable primary source we have. And you can get out there and enjoy them as a green space. You can get out there and enjoy them as a historical space. But you can connect with a space like that, and it suddenly opens up all sorts of, of new avenues for you. Mm-hmm. What difficulties did you have in getting the book published or finished? Or w- were there many? <laughs> um, in some ways, it was like herding cats because there are, um, I think, 23 different essayists that I was working with. And we had deadlines to meet. And, you know, if one person meets a deadline, it, it's a domino that knocks all things over for everybody else and so kind of keeping that whole thing managed um and this was my first essay collection uh, uh actually it was my second essay collection but uh, the first one working with this many essayists uh and and the logistics of that was challenging mm-hmm. okay um apart from the second volume is there another writing project that you're working on Actually, I've just finished up a manuscript for the University of Tennessee Press um, as part of their Command Decisions in the Civil War series, um, looking at the critical decisions of the Battle of Fredericksburg. And uh, so excited to have have the opportunity to have done a deep dive in uh, the Fredericksburg battlefield. Okay. Um, So where can people find you and the series on uh, the web? I appreciate that. It's www.emergingcivilwar.com. Mm-hmm. And there are 30 of us who who contribute to ECW. It's free content every day. Uh, a lot of different writers with different backgrounds, um, different interests, uh, different writing styles. So it's a great conversation, and we'd love to have people log on and be part of that conversation with us. You can find details about our, our books uh, there at the blog. Um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? I just really appreciate the chance to chat with you today, Chris. You had some great questions. Yeah, thank you. It was really informative and interesting. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.